Questions about love and sex have a huge amount to do with philosophy and science. Hey everyone, and welcome to Good is in the Details. I'm your host, Gwendolyn Dalski, and this is season two, episode one. And I couldn't think of a better way to kick it off than with my lovely co host, Rudy Salo, and we are interviewing. Columbia professor in the philosophy department. She's the director of Center for New Narratives in Philosophy, Dr. Mercer. We are going to be discussing what philosophy does, what kind of tools it gives us to help us live well. We're also going to discuss one of her works that I have often assigned to my philosophy students, The Philosophical Origins of Patriarchy, where Dr. Mercer deep dives into ancient Greek concepts and how that impacts us today, how we view the body today, what presuppositions we have today that are all based on these ancient ideas. Dr. Mercer is also going to talk about her experience at teaching philosophy in prison and what she is not only bringing to her incarcerated students, but also what she is learning from them. This is really a fantastic episode. I'm excited to share it with you. All right. Let's get started. Season two, episode one. Dr. Mercer, I think that something I want to ask since we have Rudy and we have you, Columbia University professor, philosophy department, Rudy teases me that Mm -hmm. philosophers don't have any answers. So I'm wondering, could you address this? Do philosophers have answers? You know, it's funny that you asked that precise question because I was in a circumstance this year where I was on a committee. One of the deans said, we want to know what the outcomes of your major is. And I got all excited about this and said, the whole point of a philosophy major is that there not be an outcome. (laughs) So maybe that's an outcome itself. Did you hear what she just said? She just answered my question. There are no answers. This see, she is agreeing with me. You're wrong. I'm right. Thank you. We're done with the podcast. No. Thank you very much, Dr. Mercer. Now, this is something that I think there are very clear wrong answers. If you wanted to say, you know, is genocide wrong? I don't think that that's ambiguous, but you are correct, Rudy, in saying that there's other things, questions about, can you define what is right and what is wrong? Then we seem to have a wave of answers and that is continuing continually evolving with context. It's making us rethink these old theories. It's- yeah, you know what? Okay, so I'm going to jump into this family squabble here. Please. Um, <laughs> and say that, I mean, I might even push back a little bit, Gwendolyn, in this following sense. So, you know, if Socrates and Plato are, are right in saying an unexamined life is not worth living, I mean, it seems to me that one of the great tools that philosophy offers, and I really do think it makes people better people and better citizens in the world and actually happier people in the long run, is to examine one's own life and all the questions that are proposed. So while we might all agree in the end that genocide is really bad, you also might want to understand how people have justified that. Absolutely. And so part of the point of my work, in fact, that's relevant to what we're going to be talking about today, is understanding how a really, really terrible idea was originally motivated. And that then gives you power to kind of undermine it. But you're not going to tell someone who is a racist or a sexist to stop being that way. You have to kind of interrogate and, you know, analyze. And I'm sure you would agree, by the way. But so, no, philosophy doesn't give any clear answers, but it gives you tools to interrogate whatever you believe and whatever you think other people believe and need to like be disabused of. Does that make sense? It does. And it makes a lot of sense. And it it basically describes why I'm just, you know, joke jokingly so dismissive of philosophy of not having any answers. I'm the type of person who, you know, when I come across a racist or when I come across somebody that, you know, clearly wrong, at first, I will try to pepper them with a couple of questions, but then I just walk away and cut them out of my life instead of sitting there and actually going through the hard exercise of using philosophy, of using those interrogation skills to like tear that person apart. I guess I just don't want to waste time with people. So I don't have patience to be a philosopher, I think is the answer. (laughs) Yeah, I hear you on that too, by the way. At some point, especially these days, it's who has the patience. I do think that philosophy really does prepare people for life. Now, I know the impact it has on my incarcerated students, but even my young 18, 19, 20-year-old students at Columbia, um, I mean, it's, it's just true, for example, that people's test scores go up 
But I also, I get emails all the time from students, you know, five years out, 10 years out, sometimes 20 years out. I got an email last year from a woman who runs a cardiology. She says, you know, uh, one of the ways she can get into the system, she has to answer a personal question. And it was like, who's your favorite professor? And, you know, it was me. And she said she was thinking that why did she put that in? Why did she have that as one of her password questions? a few years ago, and it's because philosophy continued to play such a role in her life. So here she is, like a, one of the top heart surgeons, right? And she's still thinking about philosophical questions and worrying about her views in ways that I think is, I'm, I was really pleased to hear that. I was really excited that she's still living philosophy. Yeah, and I think that is one of the goals of education is it's not a matter of here, memorize these things and then you can go out into the world, but it is to give space for curiosity and that someone who has really gained from education then continues that curiosity throughout their life. Right, exactly. And curiosity is great, but then philosophy gives you the tools to um, use it, to you know, apply your curiosity. So what I would like to discuss is your article that was published in The Nation called The Philosophical Origins of Patriarchy. And one of the reasons it resonated with me, and I share it with my students, is that it brought a lot of memories to me about understanding the way in which women were described and how it was dismissed and I accepted it. So one of the ideas about philosophy is this childlike wonder. And I can remember being a very little girl and asking, why do we say man instead of people? And it was just explained to me, well, that does mean everyone. And I remember it not making sense, but I accepted that answer. And then all through my undergrad, I never read a female philosopher. It wasn't until I was in the second year of my master's that I asked somebody, are there any female philosophers? That it occurred to me to even ask that. And my professor, Dr. Singh, he handed me a work of Hannah Arendt. And that was the first time that I'd ever read a woman thinker. Mm -hmm. I notice now in my own professional career that when I discuss the ancient Greeks and I come across this sexist language, that I am now participating in that attitude of dismiss it. It's silly. It, you know, we don't really believe it. It doesn't matter. And then I read your article. And you are highlighting that it is important that the significance of it has filtered into something as recent as the heartbeat laws that passed in Alabama. So I just want to ask you your experience as an undergrad in philosophy, if I can take you back to that time. Did you start to have the seeds of this questioning of the way in which philosophy was being presented to you? I think maybe one of the reasons I have been inclined to ask these kinds of questions is because I wasn't a philosophy major as an undergraduate. Oh, okay. Um, I did art history and was interested in kind of broader cultural matters and found philosophy a bit later. So when I did go into philosophy graduate school, I still to this day don't quite understand how I got into a top program. But anyway, that's another story. But I was just struck by the fact that the history of philosophy that you learned when you were an undergraduate and most, uh, most undergraduates learn, I mean, the way I like to describe it is that the history of philosophy as it's been told since about the mid 19th century is like a series of beads on a string. You move from one great white guy to another great white guy, and starting, you know, with Descartes, they're all uh, they're all Christians, except Spinoza is the exception that it proves the rule. So the idea of history of philosophy is just this series of great men who talked about very important topics. Struck me as just silly because I knew something about the context in which they were writing. I was especially as an art history student interested in Renaissance art and theory and so on. And so I, from the get-go, started asking questions about the general context in which these people were writing. And so though I have mostly worked on 17th century philosophy, I'm now moving back into late medieval philosophy, I was just struck by the fact that the history of philosophy that most philosophers have told is just a made-up story. You know, we think of Descartes as the father of modern philosophy, and that's what everyone has been taught to believe, right? You do er Plato and Aristotle and often just skip to the father of modern philosophy if you're studying um, the history of philosophy. And it turns out nobody in the 17th century thought Descartes was the father of anything at all. I mean, that was made up and it was made up, in fact, in the 19th century. I've been kind of exploring that question. 
So the problem with people in graduate school in philosophy is that they've been trained by other philosophers to think of the history of philosophy as a series of beads on the string. And thank goodness, in about the past 20 years, a number of us, and I'm just one of many, have been taking the beads off the string and putting it in the kind of messiness, <laughs> which is the period in which they write. And if you do that, you discover that, turns out, Descartes, was influenced by Teresa of Avila. That's something I've been writing on. She's a late medieval Spanish nun, early modern in a sense, Spanish nun. And he got some of his arguments from her, like who knew? And it turns out if you look at Aristotle or Plato and some of our heroes from the Greek period, the Greek philosophers, it turns out that they had all kinds of views that we find very problematic. For example, that Kant argued for racial hierarchies. So if you take our heroes, the beads off the string, put them in the context in which they were writing, lo and behold, there's a huge number of questions, ideas, worries, complaints we might have about every single one of them. In your article, I know that when I've shared it with my students, they are surprised at the way in which women were described, that their procreative power is their only contribution, or that Hippocrates, when he was writing about the menstrual cycle, that that was evidence of the inferiority of women. I've posed the question to my students, if women had been considered the standard of humanity, how would a man be described? It's an interesting thought. It's where I'm like, God, these overgrown giants, they don't do anything. (laughs) (laughs) Women bring life into the world. Like how, if that was the standard, then it would seem so bizarre. So women only seem small or weak if you have the standard be the male. But how has, or or that women were uh, malformed men, that's what Aristotle writes, and that they were incapable of something like virtue or reason. Could you explain how significant that is today? Yeah, one of the reasons as a history nerd, I do the kind of work I do or have been doing for, you know, a couple of decades now is because I'm really interested in, like I said, taking the beads off the string and looking at the wider story. That has very, very important implications in the sense we discover women who have been left out of history philosophy. It turns out there's a lot of very, very important, brilliant African-American authors in the 19th century, some of them formerly enslaved, who were doing all kinds of important philosophy. So that's a reason to kind of rethink the canon and rethink the history of philosophy. But I also am really moved by what is considered a genealogy. You know, like here's this idea that women are inferior, or here's this idea that, you know, whatever stereotype, whatever horrible stereotype you want to take, there's almost always a pretty long history of promoting that stereotype. And so one of the things I think that has really moved me is the fact that it's so very hard to convince people that sexism and misogyny are wrongheaded. You know, people might say, yeah, I think women are equal, and then they don't call on their female students in class. Or they might think women can be as good at being doctors. They might even explicitly say, yeah, women are good doctors, but then they always hire the the white guy to be, you know, the top person in the uh, medical department. And so for me, if you can explain the source, the genealogy, the deep history behind thinking of women as inferior, it lets people see how contingent it is. It just so happens some powerful doctors in ancient Greece who didn't let women do medicine and didn't let women think about their bodies and as active in the world, decided that women's bodies were inferior, told a whole story that justified that, which is actually pretty sensible given the assumptions, right? And lo and behold, that was passed on for centuries and centuries. And as I say in a longer version of this paper, it could have gone otherwise. There were very powerful men and also lots of women at different periods in the history of medicine and philosophy who fought against this, but the men in power always won out. And so the relationship between ancient Greek medicine and now is pretty profound. Could you explain the wandering womb thing? Yeah. One of the reasons I wanted to write this kind of paper that from which the nation piece is taken is I really am struck by the fact that I think it's very important for us to understand that lots of people who have justified sexism 
have not been as terrible people as you think they might be, right? They accepted some false assumptions. They looked at the world from their own perspective and they created a world that produced themselves in power. So the powerful get to describe what's going on in the world. And so, and for the ancients, you know, but this is before dissection. This is before people kind of thought about the body as we do today. And again, our own views about the body, I think, we project a lot onto the human body today, including a, a lot of sexism and contemporary medicine and so on. But for the ancients, you know, again, this makes perfect sense. You kind of look at the body and what is the body seen? There's a skeleton of bones and there's a lot of flesh. And the flesh itself is made up of fluids. And so if you think of a human body and human health in terms of a balancing of fluids, and you're a guy and you see men go off to war, or you see men being powerful in the world, you think, well, that kind of human being, this male member of the species, is more perfect than the female because he's more active in the world. And what do females do? Females, what makes them extremely different, the ancients thought from men, they bleed once a month and they have babies. So the suggestion was that what makes women different from men is their inadequate uh, use of fluids. Obviously, if their body was properly balanced, they wouldn't have to bleed regularly. So their health is all about fluids. And if it's all about fluids, then the womb is they thought of the womb, the uterus, they called it a jar, was in the body balanced by proper fluids. When women became unwell, that was almost always a sign they thought that the fluid had gotten out of balance and that the womb had gotten quirky. So it was turned in the wrong way or turned upside down. It could even, some people believe, go wandering. So that's the word for hysteria is the wandering womb. Um, so the idea then is you had to, if, if you had a daughter or a wife or even a mother, I suppose, who was acting really strangely or being very ill, you had to get, make sure that the womb, it was all about getting the womb back in place and getting the fluids properly balanced. And so the way to do that typically was for her to have heterosexual sex, i.e. sex with her husband, because that would then produce the right kind of fluids and get the womb turned back the right way. It's only a matter of that. If a woman's crazy, have sex with her. And then Right. Right. <laughs> well, in Aristotle's ethics uh, and in the virtue ethics, he gives us so much room. And I do like virtue ethics. Mm -hmm. He gives us so much room, so much context for a moral behavior. Do the right thing in the right way at the right time. And then he draws a line. There's three things that are wicked in and of themselves. Murder, theft, and adultery. And then I always pose to students, that list is weird. It's weird. And my, I ask, if you were to take a logic puzzle and to circle which one doesn't really fit, I am not advocating adultery by any means, but it's not up there with theft and murder. You can be president of the United States and commit adultery, but you can't do theft and murder. So why would Aristotle have it up there with theft and murder? So I give my answer, but I'm wondering, what is your answer? Why is adultery up there? Right. One thing that I, I think, like you, I was taken by Aristotle when I first read Aristotle. So even though I wasn't a philosophy major, I was taken by Aristotle and also Plato for that matter. But you think, oh, right, it sounds so awesome. So to be virtuous to do, is to do the right thing at the right time, at the right way, for the right reason. It sounds hard. But it, I remember thinking, I want to be virtuous. And then it turns out that, of course, lots of people can't be virtuous. Only people who are educated in the, in the way that Aristotle could be educated. So Aristotle's tendency to think that people like himself are the right people, the good people, the people who are virtuous, and to kind of reproduce his power dynamic and reproduce people like him, rather, is striking and, and relevant to what you say. Uh, look, a lot of men in a lot of contemporaries of Aristotle, as a lot of us know, were happy to have sex with younger men. That was just a thing that people often in ancient Athens did. Plato talks a lot about that, and it's it's all over Greek literature. So the adultery here is directed at whom, right? At, you know, who, who shouldn't have sex with someone else? It was the woman in a heterosexual, or a woman in a marriage. 
So why have that as being one of the great crimes is that you sure as hell didn't want to have to bring up a child that wasn't your child. You wanted to make sure that your, the, your wife was only having children by you, which is a, a classic tenet of patriarchy. So why is it down there? Uh, why is adultery down there with the other really pretty awful things to do, right? It's because men are making up the rules. Yeah, that's what, you know, I was thinking, okay, this is before birth control because at first the students their answer is actually kind of sweet because you you injure somebody's feelings and this and that they're using a very contemporary idea of adultery and it goes to this notion of woman as property and you can't put your stuff in someone else's oven you're messing with their genealogy right exactly and that actually brings to one of the points that you made in this article was that these heartbeat laws are written under the notion that this is protecting women women because women are fragile, they're pure. And so that this is a chivalrous sort of thing, but it actually traces back to this notion of women as inherently inferior, that it's a a far more dark undertone and uh, misogynistic position. I mean, for me, one of the most profound concepts in the history of philosophy that has done a lot of good in some ways, and but also a lot of bad, is this notion of teleology, the idea that, so if for people who believe that the world is created by some, you know, external, eternal good, they don't even have to be theist. I mean, Pl- Plotinus and Plato, for that matter, you know, we did not believe that there was a God, but they believed that the world was constructed so that everything was there for a reason. And if you believe that and you believe, so that's maybe kind of one thing to believe. It's actually not a crazy notion, but then for men in power to believe that they understand what things are for, right? So they understand Aristotle and some of these ancient thinkers understood they believed what a woman's body was for. Mm -hmm. For, It was good for the community for women to have children and raise them properly. It was bad for the community for women to commit adultery. You had to kind of keep them controlled so that wouldn't happen. So these men thought they understood entirely what the point of a woman's body was. And it's astonishing to me that you fast forward to contemporary politics and some of these state legislatures where all of these white guys sit around the table and decide Decide what's good for women's body. They know what is good for women's body. They don't ask women. They don't care what women think because they have an insight into what women's bodies are for. So one of the motivations for my paper was to understand the ancient roots of this, what I consider kind of nonsensical, power-hungry position. I read your article, and at the very end of it, where you say, if knowledge is power, then understanding the ancient sources of current misogyny might aid us in the ferocious fight. And I'm wondering, and the, the question that came to me is, This is extremely helpful background and and, and information that I thought I had concepts of, but you really put some flesh on the bones here. I'm wondering how, how could knowing this change those conservative guys' minds? This is where, this is perfect. It's a perfect tie-in into what I was saying previously about my lack of patience. I'd give up on those conservative white guys and say, forget it, you're never gonna change their mind. Nothing you say is ever gonna help them. So I'm curious, I mean, really, I mean, your approach is much better. At least you're actually doing something to maybe try to you know, plant some seeds either in their minds or their children's minds or somebody that's on the fence's mind. Do you think, like how? how, how can this help? How can you use this information to help change somebody's minds? Have you ever used this to change somebody who was a staunch you know, supporter of this misogynistic thinking of women, have you ever been able to shift somebody's thinking? Yeah, no, there's, so, there's, so there's two questions here. And one is, how can my article and this knowledge of the past be used to shift the views of these conservative guys? And I don't think it can. I think that people who are so unhumble, who are so utterly certain that they understand God's intentions, right? They're exactly, those people. exactly, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so you're not gonna like if I come in and say, "Hey, look, dudes, here's this ancient person who wrote before Christianity and who has something very similar to your views." Doesn't that tell you something about the oddity and contingency of your idea about? looking into like understanding God's intentions, they're not going to listen to me. So if I had 
you know, one of the ways I put it sometimes, if I could have some of those two or three of those guys at a time, maybe one at a time in one of my classes for a semester and get them to be open minded to what I say and what my students say, they might shift gears a little bit. But I think to be the, a politician and be like they are and to be so self-assured makes me doubtful and honestly depressed about the possibility of shifting them at all. So that's the bad news. The good news is I have students in classes, I, I teach a course in philosophy and feminism, it's, I also teach history philosophy, but I have students in class who come in as pretty religious people who believe that women should deserve a good education, but men are in some ways superior. I don't have that many of them at Columbia, but I think a lot of us do in the world. And for them, if they open up their imagination enough to really understand the history of this idea of teleology and understanding what the world is supposed to be like. And they understand then, this is to Gwendolyn's point about philosophy as a kind of process of humility, really. And I think that can actually change views, and it has. So I've had a lot of students who have had their lives turned upside down by questioning our notion of objectivity, understanding that we project onto the world, that we project our views about sex and power and all kinds of things onto the world in ways that they didn't understand that we did. The hope is literally the next generation. The hope right. is the students. I mean, because like you, I'm depressed because you can't change those people's minds, right? Especially if they're a little bit older, right? And they've got not one foot in the grave, but one foot closer to the grave. And they, they want to be really tied to Jesus and God and, and everything. They want to make sure that, that their ticket to heaven is, is clean. You're not going to change their minds. There's no way. It's just not going to happen. There is hope yeah. in the younger generation. Yeah, I, I think that's, I mean, basically, I agree with you. I don't want to tie it so much to age. I want to tie it to the capacity to imagine and be curious. I mean, we were talking about philosophy as based in kind of curiosity. And I want to say philosophy gives us tools to apply to our curiosity. Uh, again, the unexamined life is not worth living. And I have met some alums at Columbia, for example, who have had fairly traditional views. And for whatever quirky reason, they're in retirement and they want to take a course and they want to be provoked. So if they're willing to be provoked, and you give them a few arguments of this sort, their views can be somewhat shifted. But they're more humble than these politicians are because they're open to be taught or to re-examine some of their views. That's the crucial point. And also, by the way, I mean, I think one of the really scary things these days, I mean, again, not to be too political, but there are so many educational systems in the States, especially in the Midwest, especially in the South. And again, I'm from Texas, so I know about this. Um, I'm the first person in my family to go to university. I went to a really pretty bad high school. And a lot of people, a lot of politicians are keen to keep students ignorant about basic science and basic history. So some young people are themselves more set in their ways than we might wish that they were. So are they poised to be changed? I think yes, but it's not like they're that much different than a 65 or 70 year old who is, has views, but is maybe taking some philosophy class ready to ask some questions. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I like the fact that you bring up that you have people that are willing to remain curious and willing to remain open to ideals. And basically it's incumbent upon them to say, I want to explore something different for whatever reason they want to do that. Do you, do you think retirement itself, maybe they're examining their life, maybe they're looking back and thinking, well, gee, did, it, did I do everything that I could? Can retire, I mean, those people that you've talked to that have been retired, is, is there something about them looking back at their life that they're now being a little bit more open? Because that's very curious. I'm, I'm obsessed with retirement. My parents are retired and I'm always worried about them, uh, you know, educating themselves and keeping their brains healthy and like, you know, learning some stuff and 
a lot of my friends, uh, parents are retiring. So I'm just, I'm just curious, is there something about that that you've learned that is helpful in retirement that opens people's minds? I think it so much depends on um, family. And, you know, if you're married or, uh, in, you know, have a partner who is inclined to rethink the world a little bit. So imagine someone's been, you know, working hard in a job. And again, lots of people work really, really hard, right? And they, they retire and they think, let's go traveling, sweetheart. You know, let's go to Thailand or whatever it is. And they're willing to kind of open themselves up to understanding the world a little bit better. And for me, that's the necessary step. So if, whether they, they travel and actually maybe see what they're experiencing in an open-minded way, which many don't, or they take a course and just are willing to learn something new, that to me is what's crucial. But also there's a way in which I am pretty optimistic these days. And it sounds like you know, Rudy, maybe more than you are. I mean, on the one hand, I'm, I'm pretty pessimistic and I want to talk in some detail, you know, in my life and to students and friends about how bad things are. But just let's just think about what happened in um, the case of George Floyd. His murder and witnessing that changed people's lives. Or I've just been because I'm I'm a, always been a big fan of John Lewis and you know who just died, the great civil rights activist, and his death. In fact, I could get upset talking about it now. I, I consider him such an amazing hero. So I've been kind of reading about his life a bit more. And you know when. The, the Selma March, when people around the country saw the dogs and the fire hoses and the violence, that a lot of white people had their lives changed. So there are people who are so set in their ways, whatever they see, they're not going to change. But there are some people who all they have to do is see the fire hose or they see the, the violence and the hatred involved in the killing of George Floyd and they, they just change. And there's a number of people, it's clear, who were changed. In fact, there's a whole organization now called um, Rednecks for Black Lives. Oh, wow. That's amazing. It's That's amazing. really, really amazing. Yeah, and so that's the, like so you're not going to go into the politicians and get them to change, at least not in any sort of public way. But I would be surprised if some of those people, if they saw their daughter-in-law dying because she was forced to have an unwanted pregnancy, or hearing about her friend, there is some kind of vivacity to use a word that Hume uses, but. The vividness of seeing suffering and being forced to rethink assumptions, I think can happen and is actually has recently happened some. I agree with you in that uh, when people do retire, they, they do go travel, they do go overseas, they do explore some new things. That's a big part of route retirement. My worry is COVID. And because COVID has shut us down, and because right. I know my parents were going to go travel the world, and I know a lot of parents were going to go travel the world. My, my parents are very open-minded with their immigrants and you know their people of the world. But I'm talking about other people, those people that could have changed because of that travel. Now they're going to be fearing of going any place that's unfamiliar or any place that could they could catch a disease. That's why I'm a little bit pessimistic about those that might be a little bit older because maybe they can't go into a class and hear you speak in person, and they don't know how to operate Zoom, and they don't know how to take it online exactly. class. That's why I'm fearful. Yeah, I, I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> It just as how your article explores that our contemporary understanding about issues concerning women and reproductive rights, that you can look at the origins of the quote unquote science that fed into that idea. You have that with racism as well. It's absolutely astonishing to see that the hypothesis was of this hierarchy of races. And then therefore the science experiments were to try and prove that dissecting brains, weighing brains, who has the largest brain in order to kind of confirm that idea, which it never did, of course. It wasn't ever able to. With this discussion of, of women's bodies, I just, just to back up a little bit, one of my colleagues retired and the chair of my department asked if I could take over his class and I just emailed back, yes, I forgot to ask what the class was. <laughs> and then I was in the middle of wrapping up a term uh, writing a paper and going to a conference that it wasn't until right before the class that I found out the class was philosophy of sex and love. That is not my thing. I know existentialist literature. I know moral theory. And I got it. I thought, what the hell is this? I, I don't know anything. But 
I ended up, and then this is how I came to your paper and some other works, realizing that these debates about sex and love today all have the origins in this history of philosophy. And I was at the same time going through my own pregnancy. And as an adult who has studied philosophy, I have a PhD, I was in awe of my lack of knowledge of what was going on with my own body. And it really hit me. Why? Because it doesn't matter. So when we teach sex ed, for instance, which seems like what would that have to do with philosophy? But underscoring something like the method of teaching sex ed when it is taught, you just teach about a fertilized egg and then the baby comes out. Who cares what happens in between with the woman's body because it is irrelevant. That is what she is for. So my cankles and my, <laughs> and I was also a high risk pregnancy. And so that added some color, I guess you could say, to the way that I understood it. Because at the same time, these heartbeat laws were passing. I'm reading your article and I am also being informed by my doctor that my life is in danger and that my child is in danger. And so it completely changed my notion of what does it mean to oblige somebody to be pregnant, that we no longer look at it as a medical condition for the woman, or it's not that we no longer, we never looked at it as a medical condition for the woman, as something that could be life-threatening. And so to oblige her to do it really underscores this notion, but, but that's what you're for. Right, exactly. You know, for me, there's two most important implications of this, the paper that was in the nation and the longer paper from which it comes. And they're the following, which is really to the point, Gwendolyn, that you're talking about. And that is that I want to make it clear to students and to people that science often inscribes, gives meaning to human bodies. So there is no way the human body is. Science creates it in a way. And so like, in fact, your example is a, there's a really, really good example that I love to use in my philosophy and feminism class in terms of like how fertilization occurs. So back in the 1960s biology books, if you took a course in biology, you learned that the female had an egg and the egg was sitting there kind of waiting for the sperm to reach it. My joke is that it's like, you know, sitting there like smoking her cigarette with Stiletta Hills on or something like, come hither or come hither. And then there's, you know, gazillion sperm fighting their way to get to the egg. And that, what is that like? That's like Aristotle. That makes the egg passive. And all of these sperm, you know, the guy has all this active stuff the most powerful one is going to find its way to the egg. Well, it turns out that's not the way it works. It turns out that the egg itself is active in almost like selecting what sperm gets into the compound, to put it that way. So one of the reasons why we've been so, scientists have been so successful about fertilization recently is because scientists have come to understand how much activity the engages in. All right, question that hadn't been asked was a question, well, what does the egg do? Everyone assumed it did nothing but wait, right? And what did the sperm, and you can sort of describe the sperm as like, how stupid is that? How inefficient is that? That the male body has produced gazillions of sperm to just produce one baby? Like that's kind of like a, a, a waste of energy. But the description of that for decades was that the egg was passed Passive, the male was active, that's the way the world is. And it turns out the world does not that way. And we were inscribing onto the world our views about female passivity and male activity. Now, how can you explain why we would do that? Why would people not ask more uh, robust questions about the role of the egg? It's because of Aristotle. It's because of ancient views about the activity and passivity of the human body. So for me, the moral to that story one of the big points here is that we tend to believe that we know what the world is like, whether it's the conservative politicians
organizations or even certain scientists. And in fact, we are projecting many of our own attitudes onto the world. And what we need to do is ask more questions and reconsider more things. So love and sex and questions about love and sex have a huge amount to do with philosophy and science, I would say. That is what I'm learning. And actually, that's one of the beauties of teaching. That's one of the reasons why I like academia is because I'm continually learning. I wanted to ask about your work teaching in prisons, a couple of things. What are you teaching and what have you learned through teaching in prisons? I started teaching in prison six years ago, first at a women's prison, and now I run a program in the Metropolitan Detention Center in Brooklyn, which is a maximum security federal prison. And doing that teaching has changed my life, and it's changed my life in ways that are quite relevant to what we've been talking about. I went into prison the first time thinking that there was probably some really, really good people in there who needed to be educated, but I wasn't prepared to see quite so quickly, quite so vividly, how astonishingly curious and eager and smart and brilliant they all would be. So I've had students who are in for what we would consider very, very dangerous acts. Don't want to go through the list of what people have done, but they're people who have done things that if you found out you were going to meet someone who had done those things, you might be really worried about meeting them. And yet, they are some of the most loyal, brilliant, and good people I've ever met. So I've learned a huge amount about human dignity, about human capacity, and human promise. I've learned a huge amount about forgiveness, but also I've learned about the power of philosophy. What I've taught is I've taught ancient literature because I think ancient literature is like really weird and it gets people outside themselves. And we've done really hard philosophy on like Antigone, you know, the ancient play Antigone. Oedipus and things like that. In fact, we're reading Gilgamesh. We often read Gilgamesh, which is the oldest extant epic there is. And these students find it really hard, but they love the fact that they're being challenged in this very profound way. And they have their lives changed. And they have their lives changed because we take them extremely seriously and we say, we're going to kick your butts. You know, you have to do this work and it's really hard. And that is just thrilling to them. But then they have the opportunity to ask themselves philosophical questions and to wonder about what is virtue and what's the role of, like one of the things we talk a lot about is how suffering and loss is a requisite often to wisdom. And of course, they have suffered a lot and they have lost a lot. And they have sometimes done pretty awful things, which they embrace and recognize. But they see that as a part of a, the possibility of having a virtuous and better life. So it's really changed me as a person and as a teacher and made me, in a way, actually to, to Rudy's point about you know being optimistic, it's made me very optimistic because if you can get people in a room when they want to be imaginative and humble and think about what there is to learn about the world, they will learn a lot and acquire a kind of virtue of humility and questioning that I find very, very powerful. That's amazing. And by the way, I'll say that some of the women, I mean, some of the women were in for 20, 25 years, you know, very, very long time, but I met them when they were just a few years out from getting out. And they're now some of my best friends. And some of the men um, at MDC, that's more like a holding cage. And some of them, but a couple of the men there were in for a pretty long time too, again, it's a complicated story. And I see them frequently and they're very involved in supporting my prison program because they know the radical change it made in their lives. So that's what we do, what we've been teaching. I kind of have this, what I now call just ideas. Uh, so it's, it's a program called Just Ideas, where the idea, where the point is that we teach like great ideas and, you know, do them in a dynamic way that really speaks to people. So that pedagogy of the people who are out are really, really keen to support. So they sometimes go and give lectures with me to support the program because they can speak to its power. I am almost speechless because I, <laughs> I'm thinking the people in, are your students in the prisons, is this the first time that they are encountering these ideas? Do they have a high school education? Um, the one, to get into my, uh, the program 
at Turconic and the first couple of courses I taught at MDC, people had to have a high school diploma of some sort, even if it was a GED. But now the program I developed allows anyone who wants to walk in the door to come in the door. Okay. So I have 20 students in a class. The classes are very short in the sense we only meet three times. It's for three hours each. We teach books like Antigone. We teach, we teach books like A Doll's House. And the men have to write a bit, but they mostly just talk and discuss. And we do these exercises that liven things up. And they do a lot of group work, but they can walk in not even knowing how to write a decent English sentence. But the point is to motivate them to think about themselves differently, but also to maybe want to go get more education or get their high school degree. And some of them then go off to college. I mean, some of our students have gotten into Columbia. That's really exciting. Uh, Rudy, did you have a question? No, other than and uh, just out of curiosity, Dr. Mercer, have you gone to the prison wa- during the pandemic and, and been in there? Or is it, I imagine all, all these programs now, unfortunately, yeah, shut we're, down. Yeah, we're in lockdown. There's, there's no way. In fact, I was in the process of teaching a class and we couldn't go in the last day. That was wow. for the class. But we're, I'm just in communication. If I guess something else I have to do today. I'm in communication with the woman who runs the education program at MDC. They're going to let us now send some materials in for them. Great. So they can kind of do self-teaching. The It's a long story, but there's very few women in the prison and they have enough space so they can have like a book club. But we normally teach the men and the men are locked in their cells. So they have nothing to do. I mean, it's just breaks my heart. Yeah, it's, so that's awful. We can't, we can't do anything. We, so we can't even send them stuff to do because it won't get to them. But, you know, as soon as they can get out of their cells and congregate, then we'll start sending in materials for them again. That's great. But it really, it's just heartbreaking. Yeah. Well, yeah. Dr. Mercer, thank you so much for your time. I'm looking forward to sharing this interview with my students because I'll yeah. pair it now with the reading on the philosophical origins of patriarchy. I'll also link that to the show notes. Okay, great. Thank you both and good luck to you. Thank you so much for listening. We have a lot lined up for you for season two. If you are enjoying the content, please rate and review the show. And if you would like to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash good is in the details. I will also link that in the show notes. Okay, so I hope you're all still social distancing. I hope you're still wearing a mask and not hoarding toilet paper. See you next time. Bye.